Existential elimination is a rule in which we um, attribute some name to an object that we know exists because we have an existential statement saying there is some object that has a certain property. So in existential elimination, what we do is we give a name to this object and then we reason from the sentence thus generated to some conclusion. Um, within uh, that conclusion, if the, if the name is not included, then we may pull uh, the um, conclusion that we've reached outside of the subproof in which we've substituted in the name C, for example, for the variable X. So in this case, we can see this rule at work. So here we're presented with the formal rule. In this case, right, what we have is existential elimination. We have an existential statement. Um, this says there exists some X such that X, whatever, whatever is contained within this uh, sentence phi, um, this predicate statement phi. Um, and then what we do is at uh, step in, we say suppose that this object X has the name, in this case, C. And then we replace C with um, every instance of X within that predicate sentence dropping the existential quantifier from the front. So we get some new sentence there. And then we reason from that sentence, eventually reaching some conclusion psi in this case. And our conclusion psi is supposed not to have uh, any instances of the letter C within it. And if that's true, then we can derive psi at the main level of proof outside of this subproof. Now, importantly, the name C must not appear outside of the subproof. We don't want C to have come before the subproof because we don't want any special properties attached to the name that we're using to reason here. Additionally, C must not appear outside of the subproof because C was just this name we made up to talk about whatever object satisfies the property um, attributed to some X or other. Um, now, again, at this instance, uh, when we apply this rule, we will cite existential elimination, we'll cite the existent, existential statement, and the subproof that led to our conclusion psi, which does not contain C. Okay, let's see this rule at work. So here we're given uh, the statement, there, there exists some object X, such that X is T and X is S. And we're also told that if there exists some object which is either T or S, then it follows that it's not the case that uh, A is T. And our goal here is that it's not the case that A is T. So how are we gonna do this? Well, first of all, we want to draw a subproof. So we're gonna add our Fitch line here, and we're gonna put in a Fitch bar, and then we're going to assert, um, and I need to put in our steps here, one and two. We're going to assert at step three that um, that uh, we're going to give a name, let's call it A, to uh, the object that is both T and S. So we will say T A and, oh, sorry, cannot be T A because A appears outside of this subproof. So we're going to say T B and S B. Okay, now, if, uh, if B is both T and S, then at step four, we can derive that um, B is T via uh, conjunction elimination of three. Um, at step five, we're going to assert that, um, that it follows that if uh, B is T, then uh, either B is T or B is S via disjunction introduction from four. And now we can use our existential introduction rule because we know if B is both T or S, that something must be T or S. So we can assert that via uh, the following, there exists some X such that X is T or X is S. And that will be via existential introduction from five. Now at step seven, we can use good old conditional elimination to assert it is not the case that A is T 
conditional elimination from two and six. And now we've reached a conclusion that does not contain the name, which we introduced here, right? Um, so uh, we've ended up with something um, that does not contain B. And so we can assert, and, and indeed this thing is our conclusion that we desire. So given the rules of existential elimination, we can assert outside of this subproof that it is not the case that A is T via um, existential elimination from our existential statement we're eliminating here is step one. We know that because that's the one that we end up replacing the variables with, with uh, um, constants with at step three. So we're going to say one and then our subproof here, which is step three through seven. And so that is the end of our derivation that A is not T using our existential elimination rule. All right, see you soon. <laughs>